Welcome, everyone, to the debut edition of the Monday Night Warfare podcast. I'm JR Judy, independent professional wrestler, announcer, commentator, and I guess now podcast host, joined by my best friend, Wade Skaggs. Wade, what the heck are we doing? I don't know, JR, but I'm telling you right now, I'm not an independent wrestler, but I am a wrestling aficionado, okay? My whole life, I've loved wrestling, and so have you, and that's why we're doing what we're doing here today. We're going to jump in the DeLorean and go back in time to 1995 here on the Monday Night Warfare podcast. Pretty simple content. We're going to look back at the Monday Night War, WWF, WCW, but we're going to do a little twist. We're going to take it to the extreme, Wade. Bro, my whole life I've taken it to the extreme in many different ways. Um, I don't know if you can say that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But yeah, we're adding some things. We're adding some ECW. We're adding some pay-per-views. It's not just Monday nights, JR. We're going to take a a comprehensive look back here at the Monday Night War era. Every Raw, every Nitro, we'll get into Thunder, we'll get into SmackDown Heat, and then we're going to have that kind of ECW vibe. It's going to be that 1995 tape trader where you don't get every episode of ECW, but hey, your buddy said, listen, you got to check out ECW Hardcore TV. And then eventually the ECW pay-per-views, ECW on TNN, and by the time we get to like 2000, there's going to be so much wrestling every week. I, honestly, I'm looking forward to it and dreading it at the same time because that's a lot of wrestling content. Let me tell you, even maybe even more than there is now. I mean, I look back at this and like even this first week we did, I, I thought I watched a lot of wrestling as a kid and like mm. remembered a whole bunch. I did not remember like 75 percent of this week that we did. If you remembered 75 percent, or uh, wait, did you say you? I did. Or did? <laughs> did okay. Well, if you missed 75 percent, then I missed 95 percent. Okay, because <laughs> at this time we were four years old. And, uh, you know, I didn't really watch wrestling, you know, maybe 96 or so. I kind of watched sporadically with my dad, but like, man, so much of this stuff is new to me. Like I'm sitting here watching these shows and I'm like, bro, who's going to win between, you know, Sting and Hawk versus Ming and Kurosawa. That's just the first match we're going to be talking about. No clue whatsoever. So, so many of these things, I have no clue. I'm so psyched to be getting into this uh, Monday Night War. Like, I remember watching, like, Bash of the Beast 95. Like, that was the first paper I vividly remember watching, mm-hmm. only because it looked so cool. But, like, mm-hmm. I, remember the, I remember the Clash of the Champions that we're, we're going to talk about. But, like, SummerSlam 95, I didn't watch. I didn't watch ECW in 95. And I remember, like, go, even, like, when we get later on to the Monday Night War, like, I'm older, my fandom's getting bigger. Like, my dad would record the shows for me on Monday mm-hmm. and for Raw and Nitro on, on the old VCR. Now, if you're listening to this and you have no idea what a VCR is, just buckle up for a <laughs> lot of 90s references. Um, so, we, we're, we're watching it, and he would, rec- he would channel flip like everybody was doing on Monday nights. Mm-hmm. But, like, I'm seven, eight years old. I'm watching a yep. tape the next morning. And I'm like, Dad, mm-hmm. why are you flipping channels? And I didn't understand it. So, now it'll be a cool way to look back, I think. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It'll be the greatest way to look back. You know, and it's like... When you, I don't know, when you don't really watch much back then, and then you get older, you get a more appreciation for it, so you go back and watch it on the network, or WWE Network, that is, uh, now Peacock, or you watch it on YouTube or whatever, and it's it's great seeing those clips, like watching Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, going down in the beer truck, but it's another thing entirely to have watched it back then, and now what we're doing is, week by week, going back and watching it, it adds a whole new element to it, with all the context it's going to be so much fun. And week one already, I'm already having fun with this. I, I think we're going to be able to see the progression of wrestling as a whole, specific characters who are you know still big names today, and also really society as a whole. Like I know, like if you look at the crowds in like these 1995 shows, and then you spoiler alert of like what happens in '98, like the crowds are rabid. By the way. Mm-hmm. If at all, at any point in this podcast, if anybody calls spoiler alert, like this is 27 years old. <laughs> like you can't call spoiler on this anymore. Yep. All right. So this first episode, we're calling it Prelude to War. We're basically going to set the stage here uh, for what's to come. We have not gotten to a first head-to-head Raw versus Nitro in this because the first night that Nitro runs, Raw is preempted by the U.S. Open. It's a perfect time for Nitro to debut. So we're going to have a look at the buildup to the first head-to-head. We're going to look at WCW Clash of the Champions 31 from August the 6th of 1995. We're going to look at Monday Night Raw from August the 21st, 1995. It's a very important episode for a couple of reasons. One, it's the lead into SummerSlam. It's also the last Monday Night Raw episode before Nitro debuts. There's a huge gap where there's no Raw, which is oh, yeah. absurd weeks. to think about now. 
It's Too a straight thing about now. Yeah. Uh, we're going to look at SummerSlam. It's August the 27th, 1995. It's the last pay-per-view from WWF before Nitro. Mm-hmm. And we're going to look at ECW Hardcore TV, August the 29th. That's the final ECW episode before Nitro. And that one especially plays a big role into future episodes of Monday Nitro. Absolutely. And then we're going to we're going to you know cap off this episode September the 4th 1995 it's the debut edition of Monday Night Nitro from the Mall of America. Um, so before we get to these episodes Wade when when I sent you this list was there anything that stuck out like all right I'm looking forward to this one or ugh I'm dreading this one. For this week or the whole or for the whole thing. Uh, for this week. No, no, no. I uh you know it's that's what I was talking about earlier. The cool thing about it is I'd have no clue basically what's happening. Like I know big things like Diesel. Well, I won't say it yet, but you know what happened to Diesel at SummerSlam, whatever. Like I know big things that happened, but so much I have no idea. So I'm, I was really looking forward to, even if you might consider it a boring show, uh, still looking forward to seeing it, probably for the first time. Well, and these and these boring shows, like I like there there is a show on here where I was going into it like, ugh, this is gonna <laughs> suck. And I there was multiple times I texted you where I'm like, man. Mm-hmm. This match was way better than it should have been. Oh, yeah. Um, so, and, and before we get going, we are actually rewatching these shows, like, top to bottom. We're not going, mm-hmm. like, I read these results on WrestleZone. Or, like, no, we're, we're sitting down and we're actually watching these shows and getting our actual feedback with a very different lens than we had the first time. Mm-hmm. So, let's set the stage here. We've got all the champions going in. This is as of August the 6th, WCW. Ready for the Clash of the Champions. Hulk Hogan's the WCW World Champion. Sting's the United States Heavyweight Champion. The Renegade is the World Television Champion. And Dirty Dick Slater and Bunkhouse Buck, the Stud Stable, are the Tag Team Champions. That 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 pretty much sums up like WCW early 95. Like That mm-hmm. set of champions, I think, is a really good representation. Absolutely. I love seeing the United States Championship around the waist of Sting, my second favorite wrestler of all time. Uh, behind behind me, great. right? Absolutely behind you. 100%. You're such a liar. You're such a liar. <laughs> All right. My apologies to Chris Jericho. <laughs> um, WWF champion is Diesel. Intercontinental champion is Shawn Michaels. The world tag team champions are Owen Hart and Yoko Zuna. That's a fun fact to keep note of because you do not see them mm-hmm. at all, like in the build up or at SummerSlam. Mm-hmm. And the women's champions are Lundra Blaze. That title is still hanging around right now. Yeah, for now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Over on ECW, the World Heavyweight Champion is the Sandman. ECW World Television Champion is Eddie Guerrero. And the World Tag Team Champions are Raven and Stevie Richards. That's a fun pairing to look forward to. I I love that pairing. Me too. I think it's time to kind of dive in here. Uh, you're, uh, you're the house, play, you're the housekeeping's the out of the way, and now it's time to get everything dirty again. You, you ready to hit the play button on 1995? I'm so ready. All right, so we're going to kick it off. Clash of the Champions 31 on TBS. That's like, first of all, Clash of the Champions on TBS. Like, I loved those as a kid. Mm-hmm. They felt so cool because WSW made them a big deal. At least they made them feel like a big deal. They're trying to draw a good rating, and they drew a 3.0 rating here. So, like, it's a, wow. that's a big rating. Very nice. Yeah, absolutely. Was that on a, was that on a Tuesday night? I believe so. I don't have my 1995 calendar up anymore. I, think, I took it down. I don't remember, but either way, yeah, it's an awesome, uh, it's an awesome event. So they're from the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, Florida. Here's one of those things that'd be really interesting to look at going forward. Eleven months later, here comes one of your big spoiler warnings. Eleven months later, they're in the exact same building for the formation of the New World Order, and like looking at the crowd for Clash of the Champions 31, and looking at the crowd for Bash of the Beast 96, it is a totally different vibe. That's day and night. Like this crowd throughout the entire show was dead. Mm-hmm. Like I Pretty thought much. that I thought they were dead. I yeah, was. They got into it. Uh, they got into it like in the end, like in the main event. But before that, yeah. Even when you had uh, you know, great matches and great wrestlers in the ring that you think would get good pops and everything, not that into it really. So we kick it off. Uh, we get the in- the classic intro of the Clash of the Champions, kind of running down the card. I think that's a great idea. I think more shows should do that. You, mm-hmm. you know, it, it hooks you in. If you if you tune in right at eight o'clock, here's everything you're gonna see from match wise, and you kind of know. All right, cool. Vader's wrestling later. I'm gonna hang out for Vader or Flair's wrestling. I'm wrestling for you know, hang out for Flair. Mm-hmm. Start with a tag team match. First of all, Michael Buffer's here. Oh like, yeah. They paid big bucks for the Clash of the Champions. Give oh, Michael Buffer. I'm sure Buffer. they did. I'm sure. So we start off with a tag team match. Colonel Parker brings in the man called Ming. Yes, sir. And Kurosawa. Um, first of all, Sting's theme, best version of his theme is like 95, 96. Like that is the best Sting theme. 
I will fight anybody. Well, we might have to fight because I really like his impact theme. I think that might be his best one. That was pretty good, but like the the surfer sting was was killing it. That's so true. it's Ming it's Ming and Kurosawa against the U.S. champion Sting and Road Warrior Hawk. Um, it's a very weird pairing. Animals <laughs> in Japan, so mm. Hawk's kind of here, and they're like, "Cool, you're a good guy." Um, backstory: Hawk saved Sting at Bash of the Beach from a beatdown from Ming, so we're kind of here. Uh, Ming and Sting have been feuding for a couple of months <laughs> over the U.S. title. They were in the finals of the U.S. title tournament at the Great American Bash in June. Sting beats him. He wins at Bash of the Beach. In a, like, I remember that match as like a very fun match because they were just beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> this tag match I didn't think was as fun. Um, first of all, neither commentator could say Kurosawa like <laughs> the entire time. Yeah. So like that was fun to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I noticed a lot was like Hawk looked very unenthused. Like mm -hmm. he just couldn't be bothered to be there. Um, Sting and Ming were barely in the match. Mm -hmm. So like Sting hit a few moves. He had a big fine clothesline, hit the, the jumping DDT. And like, all right, cool. Eventually Sting and Hawk hit a top rope heart attack on Kurosawa and get the win and the good guys win. The crowd mm -hmm. goes mild. Uh, yeah, for sure. A and at the end of the match, Kurosawa attacks Hawk and he breaks his arm. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know where, like, I'm going to break your arm. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's your first match of the Clash of the Champions. Not the best start, but not too bad. I mean, like you had, like, if you're going to turn it on, you have Sting and you have Road Warrior Hawk and like yep. Ming, like you've got guys who are recognizable, but, like the match just didn't do anything and what really mm -hmm. kind of confused me and it, it made a little sense after right after the match they cut to what they taped for wcw main event right before clash went live mm -hmm. and it was hulk hogan against kamala and dungeon of doom comes out hogan and stink come out for a brawl and the crowd is like super hot for that hmm. like they're eating that up and i'm like man that just burnt the crowd out. that's why they were so dead like they yeah, were that can happen. let's go hogan and then like yeah we're dead yeah uh, they cut to the Dungeon of Doom set. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. I have many thoughts on the Dungeon of Doom. Oh, we'll get there. Um, Hulk Hogan is going to the Dungeon of Doom later tonight on the Clash of the Champions. That's that's the big draw uh, from outside of the ring for this show. We cut to commercial. We come back. Colonel Parker and the Stud Stable, the World Tag Team Champions, are in the back with me and Gene Oakle, and they're ready for a five-man and a lady six-person tag matchup. Uh, it's a very weird promo. Like yeah. Dick, Dick Slater says he's going to hyper extend Sherry and then he's going to give her the good night Irene punch right between the nose. Uh, like Colonel Parker says he's ready for romance and he's going to have Sherry until he's done with her. Like that was uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't know what to do with that. Like at one side, like Colonel Parker's in love with Sherry. And then at the other side, he's like, I'm just going to have you like it's super weird mm -hmm. and punch you in the face. Yeah, it was it was a weird it's a weird build to the uh, five man and a lady six person tag mm -hmm. later. <laughs> uh, we'll get yeah we'll get there. Uh, we go to the ring. DDP comes out. He is the self proclaimed thirteen million dollar man yes, after sir. a gambling lottery ticket win. And here is the biggest injustice of the entire episode. Alex Wright comes out and there's no Alex Wright theme. His theme mm -hmm. is a banger. Alex Wright should be dancing every episode and he just runs to the ring in silence. I about yep. turned it off right there. True, true. Alex Wright. One of the underrated gems in WCW in the 90s, man. Let me tell you, I love watching this guy. And you know how much I love DDP. So, especially like heel DDP before the NWO and stuff. Just, oh, I love it. So, this matchup is weird, too. Like, the crowd's super quiet. Alex Wright's flying all over the place. Like, mm -hmm. at one point, he does a slingshot splash over the top rope, which in 1995, WCW is so out of place. And, like, he is... He is throwing himself onto the floor at one point and just smacks the floor and the crowd just sits there. Yeah. I'm like, this dude just wiped out and nobody cared. <laughs> and then we're sitting there and like Kimberly's got the scorecards giving DDP a perfect 10. Like that's, I, I love that little fun gimmick. Mm -hmm. It ends with like DDP with a roll up. Didn't even get a diamond cutter. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Like it was a fine match. It was a, yeah, it was it, solid. It's a good TV match, but like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. DDP DDP wins, and I'm sad I don't get Alex Wright's music. True. So we come back from commercial break. Ric Flair, Arn Anderson are in the back with Mean Gene Okerlund. And, and Ric Flair is standing, like, right behind Arn Anderson, but he is the most confident human. He's like, Vader's not going to touch me. Arn's right in front mm -hmm. of me. Uh, <laughs> the promo, the best line is Flair looks right in the camera and goes, Vader, if you lay a hand on me, I'm going to have Arn kill you. 
I'm just like, dang. Oh, so yeah. like the last the last promo you got, like I'm gonna have this lady, mm-hmm. and then this promo, I'm gonna kill you. I'm just like, <laughs> what is going on in WCW on TBS? That's why you call him the greatest of all time. Yeah. Uh, we go world television title match back in the arena. Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff to challenge the Renegade. This is a rematch from Bash of the Beach. Controversial finish where Orndorff's shoulder was up uh, at the Bash of the Beach. Uh, we got a commercial break before Renegade's entrance, and we got to see a Macho Man Slim Jim commercial. So, Oh, yeah. A million more points for this match. I'm not uh, even going to also... try to do the, uh, the impression. Uh, you're much better at it than I am. I'm not even going to try. We also saw a commercial for Judge Dredd. I mm, don't yep. know what those are. Like, You've never seen I, Judge Dredd before? No. Like, I, I, I have it in my deal, notes. Man. I don't even know what that is. Like, I don't even know if I ever uh, saw those toys as a kid. You're something else, dude. So, Orndorff jumps Renegade before the bell. Very typical mm. uh, Renegade match or mm-hmm. fake warrior. Uh, like, the, the best parts of the match I have written down are the Renegade, like, wrestled with the belt for, like, two minutes on his waist and it just didn't fall off. I was really <laughs> hoping he would just stay on his waist the whole time. Yeah, for sure. Um, Bobby Heenan was just ripping the Nick Patrick all match because he <laughs> couldn't true. be that bothered. That was really funny, yeah. And Jimmy Hart was the most vocal and animated person in this match. Mm, yep, absolutely uh, he was. Renegade hits a slingshot body press from the apron, gets a weird roll up, gets a win, and then they shoot fireworks off. Mm-hmm. And Paul Orndorff deserves way better than that. Yeah, absolutely he does. And Renegade's still the TV champ. So we'll move on quickly from that. Yes, like, very, very quickly. quickly. <laughs> um, we go back to Mean Gene with Big Van Vader. And Vader as a face is so weird. So Vader at one point tells Ric Flair something about his gator mouth. Ma- if his gator mouth can back up that carny and then, like, it goes inaudible. And, like, I even put the subtitles on and Peacock has no idea what Vader said. But it cracks Mean Gene up, and like he has to turn <laughs> and put his face in Vader's shoulder, and that is the funniest thing to me. Absolutely, I do. Mean Gene is the greatest interviewer of all time, and it's because of stuff like this. Because he had personality, you know. When he just, you know, he's not just standing there with the microphone saying, "Oh, okay, this and this and this," and some of the guy next to him can say the most wild thing you can possibly imagine, and they're like, "Okay, back to you, Michael Cole." You know, no, I mean, it's some freaking Mean Gene. Come on, man, he's got the most personality. That's what they need nowadays, really. And I love, like, at the end of the interview, like, me and Gene is standing behind Vader, like, trying to put the mic in his face. And he's, like, all you see is a mic and a flying hand. Like, mm-hmm. that's all you can see because Vader's just so massive. Mm-hmm. Um, hope you enjoyed seeing Vader on here because, spoiler alert, this is the last time you see Vader until 1996 on a major television show. Uh, we go to commercial. Mean Gene plugs the WCW Harley Davidson contest where you can win a 1995 Harley Davidson and a trip to Halloween Havoc. And then previews the rest of the Clash of the Champions. We go to a Fall Brawl commercial. And then we get a video package. Like, well, you didn't see a lot of video packages in 1995. But, like, they're really putting over how big of an angle the the five men and a lady tag match is. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, like, the Sherry and Colonel Parker. Like, are they in love? Is Colonel Parker, like, just using it to distract Harlem Heat? It was a, co- it was a cool little, like, build to it, I think. It, it gave you a good recap. Absolutely it was. And let me tell you, let me tell you something about the the pre match interview for this. Absolutely cracked me up because you got Bunkhouse Buck and Dirty Dick Slater. I didn't even remember they existed to be completely honest with you. The the interview before the match, Bunkhouse Buck is coming in there talking about like how he's been in the fields all day and stuff like that. He's like, oh my hands are callous because I've been in the fields all day and whatever at the farm. And I'm like, bro, what are you talking about? No one in the universe believes you're actually a farmer. <laughs> like, what gimmick is this? Is this 1983? Do people believe that he's, you know, going out in the fields and plowing stuff right here in 1995? Come on, give me a break. But I thought that was so funny. Well, I'm more impressed that Bunkhouse Buck keeps his gimmick to, like, 1997. Like, he's still <laughs> around, like, when the NWO's around. So, mm-hmm. like, doing the same thing. Like So, we go to five men and a lady, six-person tag. If Harlem Heat wins, they get a shot at the tag team titles. There's no rule on this matchup, like, if sherry can wrestle the guys or not like how they're gonna do it like, obviously you have to wrestle the guys like can't you wrestle dick slater and buckhouse buck or is it just colonel parker they never say mm-hmm. there's just no rules like before the match they've got sherry just like being held back like a oh, rabid yeah. animal but they had her, they had them holding her back for like two solid minutes or something yeah like, um, like what is happening is she gonna well, wrestle at all well like they feed to a commercial and i'm like did they just like 
hurry through the entrances. It was weird. So they went to a Harley Davidson commercial. Uh, they go, you know, they go one nine hundred four five four forty five forty five. Enter to win the the Davidson and the Halloween Havoc tickets. And guess what? I entered. Well, I tried to. The number was disconnected. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're not going to Halloween Havoc ninety five. Oh man, that sucks. So we come back from commercial, and the first thing out of Tony Schiavone's mouth is, "This match is fast and furious." And on the screen, Booker T has a side headlock on. Like, they're sitting in the ring. I'm just like, Tony, like, watch the monitor. Something, brother. <laughs> uh, they tease that. So, and here's something interesting is they start to tease Monday Nitro. And this is really, mm-hmm. like, the first show where they talk about Nitro. And yeah. we're less than a month away. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine, like, at this point... Like, so, a, I, we're not going to talk about a lot of current stuff on this, but, like, you imagine, like, AEW on Dynamite in their first episode, if they waited to, like, the last month before to start talking about the show, mm-hmm. and, like, the first, like, real mention of it is a throwaway line where they're having an Emmy Award-winning sportscaster joining the broadcast team. Speaking of that, I spent yeah. way too much time Googling and searching if the soon-to-be-announced commentator won an Emmy. He did not. He, like are you, he didn't? Dude, I checked so many websites, and nobody has any reference to this. Oh, my God. That's uh, – because, obviously, I don't remember that 1995 I was four. But this is the funniest thing to me. Like, the, an Emmy-winning sportscaster, and then Bobby DeBrain Heenan, for the entire night, is trying to figure out who it is. It cracks me up. He's – Throwing out these names, guys who are still famous today, like, you know, maybe you said like Marv Albert or, you know, he all these other names. He threw out John Madden. I'm like, yeah, they yeah. couldn't afford John Madden. Like all these things. He threw the whole night. I think even maybe the last line of the entire night was him uh, figuring out who it is or something. And that was really funny to me. I think so. Um, eventually, the crowd explodes. Like, they finally come alive when Sherry makes that tag. Like, mm-hmm. when she gets legal, I guess the first time, they're, like, really into it. She, they go after Colonel Parker. She misses a splash off the top and hits her head. And she's like dead mm-hmm. it's like colonel parker's like uh what do i do and then he tries to wake her up she pops back up and the best call of the night bobby heenan calls it a flying lip lock and she <laughs> pins him with a flying lip lock mm-hmm. and then after the match he's running and she's like coming for more and, and the tony, tony goes did she hit her head so hard she fell in love <laughs> And mind you, this oh, is how, this is how Harlem Heat gets a world tag team title shot. Like, hey, I'll take it. A flying lip lock. Amazing. So we cut the commercial. We're back. Mean Gene again, this time with Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart with the greatest red, white, and blue suit. Like, where do I get one? Mm-hmm. Um, Hulk Hogan says he isn't concerned with entering the Dungeon of Doom. Is in, Even if, you know, Andre's son is in there, they're really playing up like this is Andre's son right mm-hmm. now. Weirdest line about this entire promo is Hulk Hogan says he mentions all the people from his heritage, the Irish people, the oh, O'Reillys, yeah. the Hogans, the McMahons. I'm like, that is the weirdest bloodline. None of that makes sense. It absolutely was. I was I was so caught off guard by that. I'm like, bro, what are you even talking about right now? Where is this coming from? And of the four Hulk or I guess five Hulk Hogan promos that we watch in these two shows, this might have been the more like the most coherent one. Like, True. his promos in 95, like, before he turns heel, are just off the wall. Mm-hmm. They have to be, really, to get people's I, attention. I mean, he's facing the Dungeon of Doom. Yeah. Uh, Hogan ends the promo saying, all right, Jimmy, stay in the back. Keep the belt. Like, let's, you know, I'm going to go to the Dungeon of Doom alone. So, we go back, commercial break. WCW comes back. Um, I yeah. thought what they were doing was cool in 95. They were going to mm-hmm. donate $1 for every pay-per-view buy. Yeah. Very cool. Um, to the MDA Foundation. That's awesome. Muscular Dystrophy Association, I think. Y- yes. So, it, it, depending on where you look at it, the pay-per-view got somewhere between 90000 and 120000 pay-per-view buys. It's a big chunk of money. Mm-hmm. The problem is, like, Bash of the Beach the month prior did 100000 more buys. Mm-hmm. So, you know WCW was like, man, we're going to get a bunch of pay-per-view buys, make this good, you know, goodwill gesture. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, they bring out Tomas. He's the Google ambassador. Randy Savage comes out to meet him. They plug Nitro. Uh, everybody seems really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. I expected a run-in, which makes me a terrible person. Yeah, but that's okay. I still love it. Um, and then it just randomly cuts to a Macho Man Randy Savage tribute video. Yeah. Because, yeah. Hmm. So we go to commercial, and here comes the uh, the real cream of the show. Here comes the real cream of the crop. It's the, the cream of the crop. Oh, yeah. The cream, <laughs> the See, cream I, told the... you, I told you it was bad. Hulk Hogan enters the Dungeon of Doom. Um, first question, 
Is the Dungeon of Doom a roaming hideout, or is it based in Daytona Beach? <laughs> That's the question of the uh, of the night for me, Jr. I just I don't even know even, what to think. That's dude. not even my biggest question. My biggest question is why is everybody yelling? Like mm. Hogan walks in, he sees the master and Kevin, Kevin Sullivan. The rain is coming down, and everybody's yelling. Mm-hmm. Like the master always yelled. That made sense. But like Hogan's yelling and Kevin Sullivan's yelling and the giant comes in from behind Hogan and he's yelling. He rips the cross off of Hogan's chest. That's a nice touch. Like that. Yeah. If, they're, if you're going Andre's kid, that's mm-hmm. great. Yeah, for sure. They have to definitely play that up. That's a great angle to play up and they'll be facing each other soon. So that's good. So he call you know he calls himself the son of a giant. He grabs Hulk by the throat. Here comes Shark Kamala Zodiac. They start putting the boots to him. Vader randomly shows up and starts attacking mm-hmm. the heels like he was kind of on the fence if he was with the Dungeon of Doom or not before he turned babyface. Vader knocks out Shark and Kamala with one punch each. Way to make them look like they're credible threats. Mm-hmm. And then Sting and Randy Savage and Jimmy Hart come from somewhere else. And then the, they they drag Hogan away. Vader and Giant go face to face. Everybody leaves, and Giant goes, "Run, you cowards!" As all the good guys run away in fear. Yeah, let me just let me just say something about this, Jr. Okay, I got I got thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts. Oh, but I'm gonna the go thoughts on a rant. are forthcoming, my friend. Uh, the whole night, this is built up to be like the greatest thing ever, or at least in my mind, because I don't remember this. It seems like it's going to be the greatest segment ever, like. Hulk Hogan's entering the Dungeon of Doom, brother. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. He's going to go in there and crack some skulls, and it's going to be awesome. They're building it up like, here in my modern brain, I'm thinking it's going to be like some kind of Firefly Funhouse or something along those lines. He goes in there, and he's in there for like two minutes. And it's then it's just like over. I thought it was going to be five, ten minutes, like a good-sized segment. He's in there two, three minutes, and then it's over. Really uneventful. I was very uh, disappointed, honestly. It's very uneventful. Like it obviously continues the story with the Dungeon of Doom, and yeah. it'll it'll continue to get wackier. But it also told me one thing about Hulk Hogan. He is the most polite person in all of WCW, and I'll tell you why. Hogan walks in the front door of the Dungeon of Doom. First of all, when he would have walked in the front door, he would have clearly seen Shark and Kamala and Zodiac to his left. It would have been his left. He would have seen them. He would have also seen Vader, who came from the left. First of all, how did Vader get in there? Like... He's not in the Dungeon of Doom anymore. Then, from his right, Sting and Savage and Jimmy Hart. So, there is two, you know, theories of, there's two theories here. Either everybody lives in the Dungeon of Doom. Like, in the entire <laughs> WCW lives in the, in the Dungeon of Doom. They're all just trapped. Mm-hmm. Or everybody else just broke into the Dungeon of Doom, and they're terrible house guests. Like, Hulk Hogan yeah. is the, the only guy who used the front door. That's true. Absolutely true. <sighs> and, and, that, and that's why the Dungeon of Doom drove me nuts. Oh, man. And it'll still keep going for a very long time. I think not like another year. Yeah, more than that. Like, the Dungeon of Doom is around, like, with the NWO. Like, that's a crazy thought to think about. Like, yeah, the Dungeon of Doom <laughs> and the NWO exist in the same universe. Mm-hmm. So, we go. A commercial break. More Judge Dredd commercial to get Hot Pocket commercials. So, mm-hmm. I got hungry. We got, big a, we got Big A Auto Parts. Uh, spoiler, they sold in 1998. Uh, then it's time for the main event. Handicap match. Vader comes out with the big giant helmet. That thing's the best. I don't yeah. care what anybody says. Very cool. Um, they talk about how Vader refused the power of the Dungeon of Doom during his roadkill tour. The roadkill tour was like the best buildup to Bash of the Beach because it was literally just Vader just power bombing every job guy. Mm-hmm. Just random nobodies. He would just come to shows, power bomb them, and just break people. Uh, Michael Buffer says it's the first WCW handicap match ever, and I feel like that's not right. Yeah, I, I was very taken aback when he said that. Very surprising. Like I'm I was I, prob- I, like I started thinking about it. There's no way for me to know without looking it up, but I was too lazy to look it up. I guess I could have swore like late '80s there was something like because like Paul E like would wrestle matches like mm-hmm. and I, I've like I'm 95 percent sure there's a pay per view like main evented. Like, it's a handicap match, like, Rick Steiner against, like, Paul E and one of the dangerous... Like, it doesn't make mm-hmm. any sense of, like, why it's the main event, but, like, I'm <laughs> pretty sure it's a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they say Vader's still the number one contender for the world title. Uh, take that, you know, as you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arn Anderson hits the spine buster on Vader. Mwah! Mm-hmm. Chef's kiss. Beautiful. Best spine buster ever. Uh, Flair tags in, doesn't go for a pin. That's a, re- that's a returning theme in this match. Crowd just is going bananas anytime Vader does anything. Like, mm-hmm. especially to Flair. Like, the crowd is all about it. Uh, Anderson hits the DDT on Vader. Flair tags in. Again, doesn't go for the pin. 
Vader hits this top rope splash on Flair, and it is like crushing. Mm-hmm. He's dead. I thought his bones turned to dust. And then Arn tags back in. Vader hits a gut wrench power bomb. Smashes Arn with the power bomb. Flair doesn't try to break it up. Vader wins the handicap match. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the match, Flair gets in Arn's face, like yelling at him. Arn goes back at Flair, and eventually, like, Flair tries to leave. Arn yanks him by the hair, brings him back into the ring. They go face-to-face, and then Flair leaves. So, tension brewing between the horsemen there. But that crowd loved Vader. I was just about to say, the crowd, who's not really been into the whole show, just went wild for Vader. Such huge pops for this guy. And they finally get into it at the end of the night. So, that's great. So, after the show, Hogan, Sting, and Savage come storming back out. They've clearly made it back from the Dungeon of Doom. They're all safe. And the first thing out of Hogan's mouth is he wants to know where Vader's coming from, bro. So Vader's like right there. He would have had to walk by Vader. So Vader just turns around and comes out and just starts yelling mm-hmm. at, at Vader. And Vader goes, Vader tells Hogan, nobody tells Vader what time it is. And I'm like, man, there must be no clocks in your house, Vader. <laughs> oh, if there man. is, like Vader's punching clocks off his walls. Yep. He calls them all <laughs> punks. He leaves. And then Hogan declares war on the Dungeon of Doom. Fade to black. Bobby Heenan probably yells about the Emmy broadcaster. Mm-hmm. Who is it? Who is it? Cut to black. Yeah, and that's the Clash of the Champions. Like, it is a very all-over-the-board show. Yeah. Not a bad show overall, but, you know, not the best either. We're going to fast forward a little bit of time. It is August the 21st, 1995. It's a pre-taped edition of Monday Night Raw. This is the final Raw before SummerSlam. We're going to shift gears here. And we open it up with a recap of WWF superstars. Let me let me throw this out here really quick. Um, I guess we're you know twenty some odd minutes into the podcast. I'm going to make a rule here. We're not going to watch every syndicated show. So like no superstars, um, no Action Zone, no WCW Worldwide, no WCW uh, Saturday nights at WCW Pro. Show. Yeah, yeah. So none of that. Um, but. We'll occasionally watch ECW because that's important. It's the only TV show. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to uh, watch a little bit of Sunday Night Heat too down the line, aren't we? We're going to do we're going to do every Heat because those actually have storyline mm-hmm. implications. What about Velocity? That's the real question. That didn't start till after the One Night War, so we're good. Oh well, huh? <laughs> See, as uh, I told you, I don't remember. So we kick it off. Ago. Undertaker pre-tape promo in the back. He's saying he's going to take out every uh, member of the Million Dollar Corporation. He's in a feud with the Million Dollar Corporation, specifically Kama, who stole the urn and melted it down. Uh, they showed a recap of Kama just straight up attacking a fan who, you know, had a reef. Uh, we get the raw intro. King Mabel comes out, and man, those guys carrying Mabel. Bro, I saw that, and I'm like, like this is a cool, like it's a cool thing. Like he's the king and everything, but bro, my guy Viscera, Big Daddy V, he's got to be 500 pounds or so, and these guys they're muscular dudes, but like, jeez, man. I'm thinking, what are these guys going through right now? We get a tag team match. It's men on a mission. It's Mabel and Mo against Roy Raymond and Joe Hanlock. Um, so I have a couple things to note here. Uh, Joe Hanlock has a big S on his boot. Why? Uh, also, Vince has no idea who's who. Like, has no idea. <laughs> Join the uh, club, they, Vince. Yeah. They announce uh, that during this match that on the – September 11th edition of Raw, it's the season premiere, so that'll be the first time they go against Nitro. Sid's mm-hmm. going to face the Intercontinental Champion, whoever whoever wins the ladder match at SummerSlam. Uh, Handlock at one point gets spiked with a pile driver by Mabel. Like, why was it that, his finisher? Like, he killed that dude. Mm-hmm. Um, Mo hits top rope elbow, breaks up the pin. Diesel's chant starts coming through. That sounds very piped in. Mm-hmm. And then Mabel hits the big belly to belly to win the match. Men on a mission to the surprise of nobody wins. Let me uh, tell you, bro. I Sorry to interrupt, but that belly to belly, I even wrote it down. Like, this is the like the hugest belly to belly I've ever seen. That yeah. thing was delicious. He killed that man. Um, so, Men on a Mission gets the microphone after the match. Mabel says they're the greatest tag team of all time. He calls out the Allied Powers for another tune-up match tonight. My thought is, like, why are they moving Mabel into a tag team feud before his title match? Like, he's not even done with his title match. And they're like, mm-hmm. hey, let's have them feud with Allied Powers. Uh, we cut to Dean Douglas presents the report card. <sighs> Those are rough. I don't know why we had so many of these. Um, this time, Dean Douglas says he's impressed. His definition of the word is dominate, uh, to rule or control completely. So there's your vocabulary word for the episode. Um, he grades King Mabel NC for new champion, and he says Diesel will have his class dismissed. Yeah, I remember when I got an NC in school one time. It was pretty good. I, I, you didn't get new champion, did you? They didn't give you a belt? They didn't give me a belt, and I uh, 
walked out of the classroom. <laughs> They, they, they announced Dean Douglas. <laughs> they announced Dean Douglas is going to critique matches at SummerSlam. Kill me now. Uh, we got to a quote-unquote live shot of Vince and King. They're promoting America Online, like Vince on America Online, and like Vince McMahon on America Online in 1995 sounds just as weird as Vince McMahon on like any sort of internet today. Absolutely, it does. I this was this was <coughs> excuse me. This was so funny to me. I'm sitting here. I'm just imagining. Vince McMahon, like I, I remember seeing uh, promos later on, like a couple of years from now, like DX sitting in front of the computers and stuff. But to see Vince McMahon, like sitting in front of a computer like this, like chatting with people on AOL chat rooms and stuff, is such a funny visual to me. And I wondered if he actually did it. Did he actually do it? Do we know? I, I tried to call. It was one eight hundred nine one six ninety nine sixty six. I called. Uh, they they were giving out a complimentary software package with uh-huh. ten free hours of America Online. Like ten mm-hmm. hours is a huge time. Uh, it was disconnected too. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, so we go commercial break, come back, talk about, uh, Todd Pettengill runs a package saying how Sid was sabotaging Sean and blindsiding Razor and he doesn't care who he faces. He's going to be the champion, whatever. Uh, we get a one, two, three kid versus the Brooklyn brawler match. Um, the kid flies all around the ring to sell for the Brooklyn brawler. King and Vince only talk about the Mike Tyson fight. And Mm -hmm. then the kid hits a spinning kick and gets a pin. Absolutely. All things Uh, considered, it's a good win. After the match, King brings out the uh, Magistrator, and he draws pimples on the kid's face, and then Vince uses a Stridex pad to erase it because Raw and SummerSlam are sponsored by Stridex. Mm-hmm. Oh, Stridex big pads. So our super pads, isn't it? Oh, I, I don't remember now, but yeah, something, something like, like that. that. <laughs> uh, we get a recap. Uh, last week, Henry Godwin slopped Ted DiBiase, and then we get a singles match. It's The Undertaker versus Tsanka. This is our main event, but it's right in the middle of the show. Uh, Barry Dodinsky comes out hyping up the uh, new Undertaker Mist t-shirt, $16 plus $3.95 shipping. And mm-hmm. if you order, you get three months subscription to the WWF magazine and you get a box of Super Strength Stridex. 1-900-Titan-91, they were sold out. And the number was discontinued. Oh, I'm sure. I'm telling you. Like, I don't remember reading the WWF magazine, but that must have been so cool back in the day, man. I'm telling you. Also, I, I had a bunch as a kid. Did you? That would have been really cool. Uh, so after the commercial, Undertaker comes out. His entrance is super cool. Mm-hmm. But, like, they put another entrance, like another commercial in his entrance. So, yeah. Uh, Undertaker hits old school, I guess, or current school or school. Well, How- let me tell you something. He hit it on the first try. He did hit it on the first try. That is not a uh, recurring theme later in that's life. A, that's an inside joke. Tatanka hits Undertaker with the Samoan drop, which is the trail's end, which is his finisher, like, just as a regular move, like, in the middle of this match. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. Like, that was weird. Um, they take another commercial. Undertaker goes on the offensive. They come back. They kind of back and forth. Taker hits the big jumping clothesline. Choke slam. Tombstone. Undertaker gets the win with the dramatic Earl Hebner count. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the theme of the match was, because this was more of a back and forth than you might have thought, the theme is that he's weaker without the urn because it was stolen from him. So he's weaker without it. Obviously, he should be beating Tatanka anyway, but it took him longer to do it than you might think. So we go to the SummerSlam Insider, presented by Super Size Stridex, hosted by Todd Pettengill. I love these things. Like there's a good little like hype up for the show. Get those last minute pay per view buys. Yeah. Um. Really, the biggest thing on here is that like Bret Hart cuts a promo, and it is a very we are dentists. Like I'm fighting a dentist. I wanted to. I wanted, I wanted to go ahead. My favorite go ahead. line. <laughs> I had to write it down because it was the greatest line in Bret Hart history. He said <laughs> he's about to fight. Dr. Isaac Yankum, DDS, and he said, and I quote, five out of five dentists recommend that I extract you from the WWF, the World Wrestling Federation. The funniest thing I've ever heard. I love that so much. I love the fact that he, like, so Bret Hart's my fair wrestler. There's no, there's no hiding that. But I love the fact that he was so committed. Like, I'm going to nail this line. Like, I mean this line. This yep. is a serious threat. <laughs> uh, men on a mission show up. They challenge the Allied Powers to a tag match. Jerry Lawler says that Bulldog can't find Luger. We go to a commercial, and we get TV trivia. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Like it's a five-minute game show commercial, um, just hyping up the new season of Raw, and it's bad. Mm-hmm. It's a waste of time. They killed five minutes of this thing, or it, it felt like an hour. Mm-hmm. I don't even uh, know what to say. There's nothing to say, really. It was it was bad. Uh, we go to Jean Pierre Lafitte against Scott Taylor. Um, this is the future Scotty Too Hotty. You know, he'd be cooler when he did the worm. Yes, sir. Um, at this point, Jean Pierre Lafitte's undefeated. He has stolen Bret Hart's sunglasses. They say he stole a replica Bret Hart head. Like what? 
I don't, I don't remember that at all. Like, I remember him stealing the jacket, which he didn't have yet at this point. Mm-hmm. But, like, Brett doesn't have his jacket. So, at some point, he steals the jacket. I remember mm-hmm. him stealing the sunglasses. I don't remember the head. Like, I, I feel like that's something I remember. Uh, he puts the pirate flag over Scott Taylor, hits mm-hmm. Le Cannonball for the win. And Jean-Pierre Lafitte gets the win. So, and this is one of those things we talk about with Mabel. Like, Mabel and Mo are, like, Mabel's feeding with Diesel. But mm-hmm. they're hyping up the Allied Powers thing. Brett's feeding with Isaac Yankum, but it's also in a feud with Jean Pierre Lafitte. Mm-hmm. Like they were just like jam packing these feuds. Like, how do you yeah. keep them straight? Mm-hmm. No idea. Uh, they also hyped up the WWF Superstar line during this match 1 900 700 for WWF. That's also uh, discontinued. Jim Ross was on option six with why, Bernie La- why Big Cat Ernie Ladd was spending time with men on a mission. I don't think Big Cat Ernie Ladd ever showed up on TV. So. <laughs> That's yeah. Disappointing. Uh, we go to a gold dust vignette. He's in front of the Hollywood, uh, Hollywood sign. It's like one of the first gold dust, uh, mm-hmm. promos that we get. And I think he, he debuted like the week before, didn't he? Yeah. This might be like the second gold dust promo. And he said he's bathed in gold and he's bathed in stardom. That's, and uh, it's time for your heartbreak kid. who will witness the presence of a real star. Um, pretty much it's just a very awkward cause nobody really knows what gold dust is yet. Mm-hmm. So I got to say, I didn't even remember that he debuted so early. I thought maybe he came in in like 96 or 97, but I didn't, I forgot that he was that early. I'm pretty sure like in your house three, we get the first match for gold dust. It's either three or four. It's one of the mm-hmm. in your houses. So it's coming up. Um, Diesel's in the ring interviewing his pyro is amazing. Uh, Vince asked diesel if he's ready for the pay-per-view. They talk about how Diesel's ready for the match. The only, the only thing I wrote down is that Jerry Lawler is talking all over this interview. Mm-hmm. Like, he just wouldn't shut up. It was so <laughs> distracting. Oh, he's the best at that. Yeah, but this is a tape show. Like you could edit that one out. Um, British Bulldog comes out, wishes Diesel good luck at SummerSlam, and then says Bull- or Luger had to go home with a medical emergency. He asks Diesel if he will be his partner, take on Men on a Mission. Diesel says yes. This leads to a commercial break. We come back. Men on a Mission is coming out to the ring. We go back to another commercial break. We come back from the, the second commercial. Vince says, we'll hopefully get an update on Lex Luger's medical emergency next week. I bet you will, Vince. <laughs> Diesel dominates Mo. Mabel steps in. Bulldog comes in the ring and attacks Diesel. I forgot this happened because I legitimately <laughs> like, too. oh, dang. Like, that was that's how it happened. Yeah, I was very surprised. So Mabel beats up Diesel and Bulldog's helping with the beatdown. Jim Cornette shows up and he grabs the title belt. Bulldog hits the power slam on Diesel, mm-hmm. and then Mabel leg drops it, and then Cornette hands the belt to Bulldog. Mm-hmm. Like, wait I, a minute, Mabel's the number one contender. I, I was so confused during this whole segment. I just had no clue what was going on. I mean, you might know more backstory with what Jim Cornette was doing at the time, but I have no idea. So I was just so confused during this whole time. I literally wrote down on my notes, "WTF is happening." So like, at this point- I just have no clue. At this point, Cornette's managing the tag team champions, Owen and Yoko. So, like, that's Camp mm-hmm. Cornette. And Bulldog is going to join Camp Cornette. But, like, my, my issue was you're putting all the, the attention on Bulldog, who's not the number one contender. He's not even booked at SummerSlam. And, like, Mabel's the number one contender. Mm-hmm. Uh, they go to commercial. Diesel's getting back to his feet. Jerry Lawler's in the back. And they basically say, this is the royal plan. My favorite part is Mabel looks at the camera right at the end of the show and goes, SummerSlam, this title's going to go from over my shoulder to around my slim waist. He's the greatest. I love him. Vince comes in, recaps what happened, says the Intercontinental title match is on the 11th, and they fade to black. That's the build to SummerSlam. It's very confusing. Yeah, it is. And there's so many matches, like so many matches on the SummerSlam card that they didn't even talk about. I just, yeah, it didn't seem like a go-home raw to me. So we're going to go right Besides to, Diesel and Mabel, so. We'll go right to SummerSlam Civic Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 18,062 fans. Like, people were saying, like, the WWF wasn't drawing. And I don't know how many of those fans were, you know, not paid tickets. But, like, 18,000 people is still 18,000 people, if, if it's a real number. Yeah. Uh, 205,000 pay-per-view buys is down from 300,000 in 1994. It's also down from 280,000 for the In Your House 2 in July. That was main evented by Sid and, Sid and Diesel for the title. So... Clearly, Sid was more popular than Mabel as a challenger. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get the opening package. Vince says the largest crowd in the history of the Igloo. And we go right to Dean Douglas. Kill me now. Um, me. Yeah, he's a def- he says the definition of a dean is the administrator in charge of counseling and disciplining his students. We go right to Hakushi and the 123 Kid. Yeah. Before the match, they show a highlight from Action Zone, which added, which was aired that same Sunday morning. And it's Hakushi losing a match to Barry Horowitz thanks to accidental contact from skip to kind of build on the Barry Horowitz and skip thing. Yep. 
Two issues with that. A, like, that makes Hakushi look really weird because he lost to Barry Horowitz. Also, why are you making these wrestlers wrestle twice in a day in different buildings? <laughs> Like, you're a terrible boss. Vince says, or he asks about Hakushi's tattoos. Jerry Lawler says they represent a different message to each man and each opponent. So does he get the tattoos removed and re-added every match? Probably. Uh, he also wrestled this morning. So, like, he had to get his body re-tattooed in between his two matches. Hey, the 90s were a strange time, my friend. Uh, speaking of a strange time, this match was, like, way ahead of his time. It absolutely was. I was... Uh... Very surprised and very uh, very happy seeing this. Uh, it was a technically really good match. One, two, three kids. So I think Sean Walton is just really, in general, underrated as a wrestler. Hakushi is absurdly underrated. This guy should have been a star in America. Like, seriously. He's so good. I love his look. I love everything about Hakushi. And I'm just uh, I'm upset that he didn't become a much, much bigger star. Like, there's no way to go blow by blow from this match. It's it's mm -hmm. this this is a match that if you put it on a television show like today, it would just it would fit in. Yeah, for uh, sure. It would just, it would make perfect sense. Like at one point, Hakushi hits a handspring moonsault from the ring to the floor. Yeah. Like, what? Mm -hmm. um, kid goes for the spinning wheel kick, gets caught in the air, power bomb from Hakushi. Hakushi gets the win. Amazing match. Like Great I had match. way more fun. Like I mm -hmm. knew this match was coming. I knew it was good, but I'd never actually seen it. Mm -hmm. And like. It, it met all the expectations. Yeah. I've never seen any of these, so I'm, I was very happy with this one. We cut to Doc Hendrick interviewing Mabel. He is wired tonight. Like, man, Doc would not shut up. And that's not, <laughs> and, and sadly, we get more Doc than I could ever ask for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, we go to Hunter Hearst Helmsley against Bob Sparkplug Holly. Uh, Triple H is undefeated at this point. This is a very regal, royal, blue blood Triple H who's very yep. new. Mm hmm. Uh, a couple things there on commentary. Vince McMahon says Bob Holly is a risk taker similar to the kid in Hakushi. Did you watch that last match, Vince? No, he's not. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, Bob Holly would kill me. He's a very tough man. Mm -hmm, but, like, sure. he's not, like, there is a different kind of risk that he's doing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Vince also says that it's raining outside and Triple H would drown with his nose up in the air. <laughs> man. Um Vince says the Bulldog hasn't arri has arrived at the arena, even though he wasn't scheduled to appear. So that's going to play in later tonight. Um, <laughs> at one point, Triple H slams Bob Holly, and he's and King says he hit the floor so hard he's going to drive the whole next race with his left turn signal on, which breaks <laughs> Vince McMahon. Like he goes, do race cars have left like turn signals? Yeah, I remember that. That was good. Triple H counters the back body drop, hits a pedigree, serviceable match. It was there. Triple yeah. H gets a win. That's a, you know that's a good uh, that's a good assessment. It was there. It was there, um, just like That's the good. fact that we get a highlight from the Stradex War on the Water, WWF Superstars against Pittsburgh Firefighters in a tug of war. WWF brought all the super duper heavyweights, mm -hmm. so we can't lose to a bunch of firefighters. A tag team match next, Smoking Guns and the Blue Brothers. Tell me how this tag team match is on the pay-per-view and the tag team champions are. Also, where the smoking question. where the smoking guns come from? If you watch this back, they appear in like three seconds. Hmm. It is the world's shortest entrance. Vince can't keep track of which blue twin is which. I couldn't either. I, I honestly, I forgot these guys existed at all. Yeah, Jerry Lawler was talking about at one point how he bought five copies of Windows 95 and doesn't have a computer. And <laughs> Vince responded with, makes sense to me. And I'm like, yeah, that probably does with your technology, Vince. <laughs> uh, very basic tag team match. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote that. Yeah, go ahead. I wrote down that Bart Gunn has a nice left-handed punch that might help him later in his career. Wink, wink. The match itself, it was, as you said before, it was there. But the smoking guns were very over in this match. And, and uh, I love seeing these guys. Billy Gunn, you know, before he was, you know, Billy Gunn, you know, it was really cool. Uh, yeah, smoking guns hit their diving leg drop backbreaker. It's a sidewinder. It's a cool move. They get the win on one of the Blue Brothers. Uh, we'll never know. Yeah, never ever. Uh, go to a we go to a video package about how Barry Horowitz lost forever, and then he mm -hmm. beat Skip on Action Zone, and then two weeks later he beat Skip in a ten minute challenge where Skip had to beat him in ten minutes or he lost the match. Wouldn't that be a draw? But whatever. Uh, Barry Horowitz's promo picture is amazing. It looks like he walked into the building with his shirt on, his checkbook still in his pocket, glasses on. They said, "Barry, we need a picture. Can I change into my gear? No, we don't have time." <laughs> just stand here in front of this. Uh, this was a fun match. Like yeah. they kind of, they kind of went after it. Uh, Skip Chris Candido is always underrated, mm -hmm. like severely underrated. He's yep. too good for his own good. At the end, Hakushi comes out. Uh, this is payback for 
this morning on Action Zone. He springboards over two humans. Like, he clears <laughs> Skip and Barry Horowitz. Mm-hmm. And then Barry rolls him up for a small package, gets the win, and the crowd goes nuts again. Absolutely. One of the funniest things in this was, during the match, Sonny tried to throw in the towel. And then Earl Hebner, who's the ref, greatest ref of all time, I got to say, he goes, he yells at her and says, this isn't boxing, it's wrestling. Like, that's supposed to make sense at all, considering many times we've seen, maybe well, after maybe, but we've seen people throw the towel in the ring in wrestling. And, the amount uh, of boxing references the WWF were making at this point, like, mm-hmm. just in Raw in this was, like, like I, we were four. I don't know if boxing, like, obviously boxing was bigger because Tyson, but, like, yeah. It was weird. It just didn't make any sense. Like, mm-hmm. like imagine, like, nowadays, they're like, you know, that's not a technical foul. There's no technical fouls in wrestling. Like, it's not basketball. Like, what are you talking about? Go to Shane, or go to Dean Douglas. He gives Earl Hebner an F for failure of noticing Akushi, and Barry Horowitz gets an S for slacker. Todd Pettengo shows a recap of the ladder match. We go to the women's title match. Um, Bertha Faye's already in the ring. It's Bertha Faye with Harvey Whippleman against Alundra Blaze. Alundra Blaze's pyro is super cool. Mm-hmm. Um... <laughs> This match was better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, same. Like, Alundra Blaze is, like, matri- matri- out of pins. She's hitting the Frankensteiner. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's flying all over the place. Bertha Fay hits a huge sit-down powerbomb right at the mm-hmm. end of finish. I like, It looks like Alundra kicks out, but yeah. they say Bertha wins. I don't know. This match was way better than, like, 99% of the women's matches you're going to get in, like, three years. So I'm sure. This, this I, was you know, I don't there's just in general it's so forgettable from that time. I don't even really remember any. And uh Bertha Faye, I honestly if I never heard the name before, I wouldn't be surprised. I was very surprised when she won. After the match, Bertha Faye says she has the beauty, the man, and the pretty gold belt to put around her slim fast weight. Mm-hmm. Like, what is up with people with this slim fast waist <laughs> thing? Like, that's a second person in two shows. Yep. Like, I'm gonna make this belt fit. Like, no, you're not. Like, stop it. <laughs> So we got to a video package, Undertaker and Kama. It starts with Kama stealing the urn at WrestleMania 11. He melted it down into a ridiculously large chain. This is pre-Lady of the Night Kama. He's like in his UFC fighter days. Uh, my, my coolest thing I noted, like so two things in this casket match. They have the giant casket with like the, this is the first time that the camera inside the casket. It's a cool like yeah, visual. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. Also, like during Undertaker's entrance, Kama just stands there, like right in his face, because he's like not afraid of the Undertaker. He doesn't. You don't have your urn. I'm not afraid of you. I'm like mm-hmm. that was pretty cool. Yeah. This match should not have been this good. True. It, it was very good, dude. They were all over the place. I don't remember a casket match like doing like this much with the casket. Like they slammed. Mm-hmm. I, at one point, they break the lid of this casket. Like they're yeah, all the, over it. Yeah, the little, uh, the purple lining in there came off of it. Yeah. At one point, the Undertaker like skinned the cat and did the head scissors to Kama back into the casket. I'm like, wait, mm-hmm. what? Like, who is this person? Amazing. Uh, Jerry Lawler called Paul Bear a talent scout for a cemetery. That's amazing. That's that is a, great. That's a great line. Great line. Uh, Kama cracked the lid of the casket with a suplex on the Undertaker. Um, they just, they did so much. Like at one point, Kama goes for a pile driver on top of the casket and Taker backdrops him back into the ring. So <laughs> I wrote down Kama hits a huge power slam and goes for the obligatory go for a pin in a casket match. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then he went for a chin lock. Mm-hmm. I was like, Dang. And, and then Paul Bear knocks Kama's feet up the rope, does the Jackie Fargo strut, and goes, there's no rules. Mind you, this is like 10 minutes after like, Kama's punching Taker in the face, going, referee, that's a closed fist. I'm like, dude, make up your mind. Like, are you going to break the rules or enforce them? Like, pick your mind. Here. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, Taker flies all over the place, eventually choke slam, tombstone. We go home. Like, he grabs the big, gets the casket win. Like, that was that was a fun match. It was, it was very fun. I got to tell you, one of the things I really loved about this match was later on a really great shot. Like one of the great shots of the night camera wise is that, you know, they both are in the casket at one point and then Taker crawls out. So you think he's going to win and stuff. And then Kama reaches out and grabs his leg and tries to pull him back in. And the camera's on the other side of the ring and Taker's like trying to claw, claw his way out and stuff. And that was like one of the greatest shots of the entire night. Well, and so they, it was awesome. Great shot. And they would start to redo that more often. Like, I remember like 98 Rumble when it's Sean and Taker and Taker's mm-hmm. in the casket and Sean is like pleading yeah. for his life. Like his Taker. Like that's a cool <laughs> shot. So we go to the announce table. They're hyping up Bret Hart and Isaac Yankum, who is the personal dentist of Jerry Lawler. This one started back in the King of the Ring 93 when Jerry Lawler debuted. It's gone all the way to 95. 
they did a kiss my foot match. Brett made Jerry Lawler kiss his own foot and Brett's yep. foot. Mm-hmm. So Jerry Lawler went to the dentist and he found Isaac Yankum, who Todd Pettengill calls a demented tooth fairy. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Isaac Yankum is from Decatur, Illinois. Like that was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also says Isaac Yankum has such rotten teeth. So he can show the kids what would happen if they don't brush and floss. That's right, yeah. He's oh. doing it for the kids. Like, what What a great way around it. Um, yeah. Cherry Lawler all over Bret Hart and Stu Hart on commentary. He says mm-hmm. uh, Stu goes to the dentist twice a year, once for each tooth. So that was good. Um, they're trying. Like, both guys are trying hard in this match. It just doesn't click. Like, at one point, yeah. Isaac Yankum, who will eventually suffer a terrible fate in a fire, mm-hmm. um, hits a guillotine leg drop like he's seven feet tall like a top rope guillotine leg drop like what nope. um brett's you know trying to fight back typical bret hart comeback lawler gets involved kane or yankum hit the top rope axe handle from the floor at what point like lawler's pulling at brett's hair and the referee gets to a six count like what mm-hmm they, they let a lot go. They get his head trapped in the ropes and they start pulling on his legs, like trying to choke him. They event- eventually call for the DQ. Like, mm-hmm. man, that took a while to get to the DQ. Yeah, absolutely. And that, th- that thing just kind of was, it, it ran long. Dude, that match was so long. Like, I would not have thought it was that long of a match going into it, but it was very, like, surprisingly long. And at the end, when he- when Brett's head was caught in the ropes, that was dangerous because he could have had a Mick Foley done to him. Right. Like, the, you know what I mean? Yeah, they could have lost an ear or something and then. So we and cut. something else. Let me say something else about Isaac Yankum D D S. Okay, his theme set my teeth on edge. No <laughs> pun intended. Just listening to that drill going for like sixty straight seconds, it was awful. I mean, it did it did what it was supposed to do. It, it makes, oh, absolutely, yeah. We cut back to Doc Hendrick with Razor Ramon. Razor wants to become the first four time Intercontinental Champion. Um, Razor and Sean, the latter match, the Intercontinental Title again. There's no way to go through this blow by blow. Mm-hmm. the The backstory on this one is the WWF had said, "Hey, you can't use the ladder as a weapon." And both Sean and Razor have said, like. It was Triple H who goes, you guys can just throw each other into the ladder. Like, you don't have to use it as a weapon. So they were very creative with their offense. I've seen the argument both ways of which ladder match is better. I think the ending sequence of this one was more exciting. Mm -hmm. But the middle part where, like, Razor's working on Sean's leg Mm -hmm. for a lot of it kind of dragged down for me. At one point, point, Razor suplexes Sean from the inside of the ring to the out. And Sean just, like, hits his leg on the guardrail. I'm like, dude. Yeah, that what? was painful. The the big finish on this one, Sean hits a sweet tune music from one ladder to another. Like that's so ahead mm-hmm. of his time. It's 1995. Yeah. You're not you're Absolutely. not supposed to do that. Sean tries to jump for the belt, misses, and he falls on the other ladder. Like that's a rough landing. Mm-hmm. So then he goes back up. He gets Razor out of the ring, goes climbs back up, and he holds onto the belt, and it won't come down. So he mm-hmm. falls. He gets pissed. He goes back up, grabs a third time. Yeah, and then he finally gets it down. Razor comes back in, gives him the belt, shakes hands. They're, you know, they're still respectable allies. And now we mm-hmm. know it's Sean and Sid on September the 11th. Yep. I was actually wondering about if the, uh, if him grabbing, not being able to grab the belt was planned or not, because he pulled it off so well. If it was, if it was planned, he pulled it off incredibly well. But he, he was like upset, like, oh my God, what's happening here? I thought it was absolutely real. Do you know if it was planned or not? I don't know. I thought I expected it to be edited out, honestly. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, because I thought I remembered at one point, like, watching this. Because I've watched this match before. I thought I had seen it where it's edited out. Um, mm-hmm. So okay. I don't I don't know. But they, they, it's presented as it was in 95. After the match, we go back to Dean Douglas's classroom. Definition is bad, blah, blah, blah. He starts talking about. How Razor's a bad guy. Razor walks in and says, stop being an armchair quarterback and just punched him in the face. Like, thank you, Razor Ramon. Back to the arena. It's King Mabel and Diesel. There's no hype package or, like, any replay before the main event. Like, it's just, here's your title match. Here's mm-hmm. Here it is. Um, I wrote down again, the guys carrying Mabel aren't having a fun time again. Um, Doc Hendrick on commentary says, he knows Lex Luger's here. And Vince McMahon quickly responds with, you don't know he's here. I'm like, way to spoil that one, Doc. Uh-huh. Diesel tried. Like, Diesel is moving around. For anybody who says, like, Kevin Nash got lazy, like, man, he was flying around the ring. Mm-hmm. He does a slingshot plancha. Like, Kevin Nash does a slingshot plancha out yep. on the floor. Um, there's a spot where Mabel sits right on Diesel's back, and Diesel, obviously, like, legitimately gets hurt, and there's F-bombs being dropped. And, like, there's a whole backstory to that one mm-hmm. where, like, Vince was pissed. Lex Luger runs in, and 
instantly Diesel punched him in the face. Like, sends Luger out. Yep. That nobody knows what Luger's doing. Mabel gets Diesel to the floor, leg drops him on the floor. Like, yikes. Mm-hmm. And then Luger comes in, attacks Mo. Mabel hits the belly to belly, gets a two count. Mabel misses a splash. Diesel barely got out of the way of that thing. Diesel mm-hmm. hits a diving clothesline, gets the win. What a mess. There was no bulldog to play off the royal plan. Luger yeah. showed up, and yeah. I think Bulldog was in a backstage scene at one point, wasn't he? Uh, he might have been. Maybe at the beginning of the show. I don't remember. I remember seeing I, him. They showed him walking at some in. Point. They showed a video of him walking in that, like, during yeah. one of the opening matches, but like he yeah. doesn't play a, uh, any factor at all. Him or mm-hmm. Cornette don't even show yep. up in the main event. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's SummerSlam. That was rough. Yeah, uh, honestly, I think overall it was a really good show. It was very enjoyable. I mean, it was fun. There was there was there was more fun than than usually gets talked about because the main event's so rough. Yeah. Ke- Ke- Kevin yeah. has tried. Like, <laughs> Definitely. Uh, we're going to go a couple days forward. It is August the 29th, 1995, ECW Hardcore TV. This is going to yeah, be a pretty quick, re- it's gonna be a pretty quick recap because it's only a one-match show. Yeah. But what a one-match show it is. Bro. So we, we talked about it right at the beginning of the podcast, how Eddie Guerrero was the ECW World Television Champion. Um, we get a hype package right at the beginning of the show, hyping up Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, and their rivalry. We go into the arena, and Joey Styles says these matches were taped on August 26, 1995. And last night... That's your fifth birthday. That is my, that is my fifth fourth. birthday. Fourth birthday. I would have just been four at this point. Uh, so on my fourth birthday, Too Cold Scorpio got me a present of beating Eddie Guerrero for the World, <laughs> Televi- World Television title. Mm-hmm. Um, the network dubbing of the music on ECW shows is going to drive me nuts. Mm-hmm. Like Too Cold Scorpio is bad. Like very bad. Um, <laughs> Joey Styles says he wants to give a history lesson to the crowd and says you don't need to be a dean to get a history lesson yikes Ooh. like like he'll be back in ecw like within a year <laughs> um scorpio talks, scorpio talks about how he broke taz's neck he says the tv tiles his belt and if taz wants some he can come get some and a little john cena was inspired I was that thought crossed my mind, yeah. Scorpio, Joey Styles asked Scorpio. So the main event of this match, uh, the show, the only match of the show is Eddie Guerrero, mm-hmm. Dean Malenko, two out of three falls. And Joey Styles asked Scorpio, like, who do you think's gonna win? And he goes, who cares? I'm the champ, and he leaves. I love Too Cold Scorpio, man. I love him. Uh, Joey Styles comes back after a commercial and says that the relationship between Mr. Ted Turner's wrestling company and New Japan Pro Wrestling and the fact that Eddie and Dean both have contracts in New Japan, Eddie and mm-hmm. Dean are, are soon going to be wrestling for WCW. Uh, this brings out a huge Bischoff sucks chant. There's another yeah, word. Yeah, there. there are a, signs in the crowd, too, saying Bischoff sucks and stuff like that. Some, there was I was also honestly another word. really surprised. Oh, sorry, but I was, oh, I was just going to say. I was really surprised at how much they hated WCW. I was very surprised by that. Yeah, this is a very maybe I like, shouldn't have been with the ECW crowd, but well, like this is like the time when like Paulie is like really anti ECW. So I mean, it, it shows through a lot. Um, Joey says this is the the last time you're going to see this match. I thought it was weird that Joey Styles is doing the ring announcing. Um, mm-hmm. So D. Malenko gets his WCW music dubbed over. Mm-hmm. Um, Eddie Guerrero gets some generic ge- like generic music. Like, why can't you give him his like, WCW music? Um, so I wrote down Joey Styles is doing the ring announcing and the commentary. Pay this man all the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, the crowd's giving him a huge standing ovation during the introductions. They they uh, they shake hands. Big please don't go chant. This is a match where you you can't go blow by blow. It is it is mm-hmm. just so good. Um, first fall Eddie reverses a backslide, gets a schoolboy for the win. Second fall after a commercial. It's a really short second fall. Like, mm-hmm. Dean is very dominant in the second fall. Hits an Alabama slam. Texas Cloverleaf gets the win there. Mm-hmm. Go to a commercial. Eddie is on the floor trying to walk off the paint. This third fall is – they are going for it in the third fall. Like, brain busters, hurricane runners, gut bu- – like, the big super gut buster from, from Dean mm-hmm. Malenko. Yep. Uh, Malenko goes for a roll up. Eddie tries to counter out. Both guys' shoulders are down. Double pin. The match ends in a draw. I thought that was a creative way to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, Eddie grabs the mic. Dean, they both, him and Dean both thank the crowd. The last shot's a pretty cool shot. Um, mm-hmm. Like they're, they're following Eddie around. He's like, is he's thanking the people in the front row? Like that's a cool shot. Yeah. And that's the last time you'll see Eddie Guerrero or Dean Malenko on ECW. But uh, as stated, they're going to be on WCW very soon. So. Yep. They killed on I the mean- way out though. Oh, my God. Let me tell you, this match was a technical masterpiece, bro. Like, watching these two, these guys were masters of the craft. And just seeing these two guys put on the match of 
just, I don't even know, man. The match of the uh, year, I don't know. Uh, and you know how much Eddie means to me. So seeing a match of his that I haven't seen before, because as you said, you know, I didn't watch the VHS tapes in 95. Uh, absolutely incredible moment. Just to, just to see uh, that match between these two absolutely incredible wrestlers. And this will be the interesting part about not only the journey we're going to go on, but how we're going to look back at the Monday Night War, mm -hmm. where a lot of people didn't get the ECW syndicated show. If you were in, yeah. a, like a, in a market where you got ECW, it would have been like 2 o'clock in the morning. So like four-year-olds not going to stay up at 2 o'clock in the morning and watch ECW yeah. TV. Um, and like people, you know, in 95 were, were trading tapes. So they were getting these matches later. Some of these people ha may have seen this match, but it might have been after Eddie and Dean showed up in WCW. Mm. so mm -hmm. this will be a fun look at it um just the way the ecw roster evolves and the way the ecw roster feeds into both wcw and the wwf all right it is the main event on the prelude to war wave it is the yes, sir. debut edition of monday nitro from the mall of america minneapolis minnesota what a cool visual what a way to just make this thing look like it is a jam-packed sold out million mm -hmm. people crowd absolutely so amazing what i really love yeah absolutely you're right and you see like the big elevator here at the side and what i really love is you see the escalator going up and there's a bunch of people on the escalator and then there's people bottom row top row i mean just absolutely amazing visuals and this crowd was way different than the clash of the champions a month before like they were into the majority of the show yep, like absolutely. they they did what you needed them to do Mm -hmm. uh, so it's as we said, it's a it's an unopposed Nitro. There is no Raw this week, so Nitro is the only wrestling show on TV. They get a 2.5 rating, and I I think it was interesting that and and this will become a trend later in Nitro. They start out with like a really hot match. I'm surprised they didn't start out with a very WWF heavy match to get those like curious viewers to stay. Because mm -hmm. like. Jushin Thunder Liger and Brian Pillman's our first match, and we'll get there in a second. But, like, that is, like, and no disrespect either. They're both phenomenal. But, like, if I am a casual Monday night wrestling viewer, I am used to, like, the yep. WWF guys. And there's a lot of WWF guys on that show who you'll That's see a, later. Yeah. But, That's a very good point. Uh, you know, they're talking about WCW, where the big boys play. Right now, Jushin Thunder Liger is an absolute legend. One of the best Japanese wrestlers ever. Greatest junior heavyweight in Japan ever. That's for dang sure. So you, you, you would expect to see maybe a match. Like if it were me, I would have put Sting versus Ric Flair maybe at the beginning of the show. Honestly. Yeah. When we open the show, they introduce the new broadcast partner, partner Steve Mongo McMichael. Uh, spoiler, he I, if you want an Emmy, somebody correct me. I never saw it. <laughs> but I will say this. Mongo does a really good job throughout the show of putting over wcw he says like mm -hmm. this is a championship place to showcase championship athletes throughout the entire show especially like, in this first match mongo is just like amazing like he like these are the super athletes yeah um he, he shakes bobby heenan's hand he has a zapper in his hand and then the very the <laughs> very so the, the famous line of don't underestimate mongo mr heenan liger and pillman go watch it it's it's great yeah like it, it, it is just great they're, they're flying all over the place. Again, it's a match where if you watched it today, it would make sense mm -hmm. on a normal show. At one point, Pillman hits a head scissors on, on Liger, and Heenan goes, he went there from Bloomingdale's to Macy's and back. I'm like, <laughs> good good mall references. Absolutely. Uh, but like, so when the moves are happening, Mongo is all over commentary. Like, this is why mm -hmm. people should be watching WCW. So, like, he does what he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. They go back and forth, big move after big move. Liger hits a power bomb, the Frankensteiner. Pillman hits the tornado DDT. In the end, Liger goes for a German suplex. Pillman rolls him up for a three count to shake hands. I I'm all about it. Great match. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I was actually kind of surprised that Brian won, but definitely a great match for sure. Well, spoiler alert, what you'll see with Brian Pillman later. He, he does play a more important part coming soon uh we go to commercial break we are back with pasta mania brother oh yeah brother so Ooh, hulk, yeah brother hulk hogan's going to defend the wcw title later against big bubba who's the big boss man again that match could have been like that's your wwf heavy match big bubba rogers absolutely you're right hulk hogan, pasta hulk, mania are we are we are we uh going past pasta mania here oh no we're getting there um hulk okay. hogan said that he is slim and trim for eating pasta mania how like i eat spaghetti one time i feel bloated yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, 
we <laughs> I did find the menu for Pasta Mania. I will say for four ninety nine, like the Hulk's power pasta, penne pasta, chicken veggies, yeah. and your choice of sauce, that's not a bad deal for four ninety nine. Not bad at all. I tell you what, we'll have to put it on our Instagram account so you can see. It was really, it was really something. They, they the also, promo that he cut was so just him standing in front of the restaurant. I actually wish I could have gone to the restaurant, honestly. But there's all the Hulk, all the Hulk maniacs, and then he brought a new word into the lexicon of pro wrestling: the pasta maniacs. So all the pasta maniacs are running wild, brother. Here at Pasta Mania, brother, 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 brother. <laughs> so spoiler alert on Pasta Mania: it lasts for about a year. Um, the Mall of America replaced it with something mm-hmm. much more stable. Uh, they replaced it with a McDonald's. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Oh, there you go. The Golden Arches will defeat the Golden Mustache every time. <laughs> and a 24-inch Python's brother. <laughs> brother, brother. All right, so we go to really the the match everybody knows from this show. It's the mm-hmm. it's the United States Heavyweight Title match. It's Ric Flair challenging Sting for the US title. Flair comes out, great reaction. Sting comes out and then here comes Lex Luger. Lex Luger walks down the aisle, stands in the entrance way. Bischoff's freaking out. Security's coming out to escort Luger. There's a huge Luger chant breaking out. And Bobby Heenan goes, it's a public mall. Like, he can do whatever he wants. It's a public mall. And they're playing mm-hmm. it up like Luger's just showing up here, and they don't know what he's doing. And the crowd is just, like, really into it. The match is what the match is. It's a Sting Flair match. They're all great. Everything mm-hmm. works. The crowd loves every bit of it. At one point, Ric Flair cross body Sting over the top. Like, mm-hmm. What? Like, I, I never remember that. Um, mm-hmm. We go to commercial. They're talking about Luger. They're saying there's chaos in the locker room since Luger appeared. Heenan's wondering what he's doing since he has history of Flair and Sting. Arn Anderson comes down the aisle. And Heenan says they patch things up. Crowd is just super loud for Sting on the on the comeback. Sting hits a superplex. He gets right in the face of Arn Anderson. That gives Flair the opening for the chop block. He, get, he puts the figure four on. He's holding the ropes. He won't break the He won't break the hold. Referee keeps calling for it. Arn Anderson gets in the ring, and he breaks up the figure four. Referee calls for the DQ, and then it happens. Flair and Arn Anderson, go to bro- they go to blows. Security comes in. The the horsemen have broken up. Officially. I tell you what, I, I wonder how surprised people must have been back then. You I, mean, they, I mean, do you they think were, they were they surprised? Were, they were building to it for a while. True, um, true. So I, I like the fact they were building it for so long. Yeah. And it's a different matchup. Like they've been side by side for so long. Mm-hmm. Like WCW was not afraid to do like a different matchup, yep. especially like at this time. Uh, after the match, security's getting Arn Anderson away, and here comes Scott Norton. Like he's just yelling off the mic, and you can still hear him. Like that's how big of a voice he has. Mm-hmm. Starts yelling at Bischoff and Heenan, and he, he he goes, "I signed a contract. I want an opponent." And Heenan goes, "Don't talk to me. Talk to him." And like points right at Bischoff. I'm like, "All right, cool. We're just gonna." Let that happen now. Yep, apparently. Uh, Mongo stands up, gets in the face of Flash Norton, and here goes Randy Savage out um, to kind of make his appearance on Nitro. He goes, I wonder when you were going to get here. And I'm like, I didn't know he was coming. <laughs> so he Savage challenged Norton to a fight. Security holds him back. Bischoff says if he steps foot in the ring right now, he'll never work for WCW. Like, dang. Mm-hmm. Like, what a that threat. Was... Let me tell you. Uh, it, it was abrupt. Like, obviously, I didn't know who Scott Norton was as a kid. But like mm-hmm. he's huge, yeah. And if he were in Japan, maybe you would have. Yeah, but like he's facing the Macho Man, so I'm like, mm-hmm. cool, this giant dude's gonna face Randy Savage. Like, I got yep. that makes sense. They cut they cut to a video package for who's debuting next week, and it's Sabu, and I forgot that Sabu makes a cup of coffee running WCW. Mm-hmm. So like you talk about just all over the place roster, you've got. Your ECW guys, your WSW guys, your Japanese guys, your WWF guys, all within this first like half hour. So we go to commercial break, and we are back with Mean Gene. He announces the winner of the Harley Davidson motorcycle. I crossed my fingers, and it was Mike Hill from Coleman, Alabama. Oh. I did not win. So That's upsetting. Uh, Bischoff heists up the matches on WSW Saturday night, which, again, we're not going to watch because they're not available on the network. Like We can only do so much here. Like through legal ways were of they, watching stuff. Were they available before on the network? No, they're only they're no, only they they're only through like ninety three on on uh, uploading okay. Saturday night. But Saturday night, what, had a cool, what about WCW Pro? Uh, nothing. 
Mm. They haven't hit Worldwide or Pro yet. They, they've got WCW Thunder, Nitro, and like a little bit of Saturday Night. We get a promo from Michael Wall Street, the former IRS. He talks about how there's a new generation, and uh, he says the IRS will be watching him over. I'm like, all right, cool. IRS, Michael Wall Street, is back in WCW. We go to the main event. It's Hulk Hogan, Big Bubba Rogers for the WCW World Title. Hogan comes out, no Pasta Mania shirt. How are you going to promote your new restaurant, Hulk? Bad um, business move, my guy. Bischoff officially announces Scott Norton and Randy Savage next week on Nitro. They keep saying Mongo won an Emmy. No, he didn't. Mongo also called Hogan too much of a technician for Big Bubba. I said, okay. Wow. Uh, there's two signs in the front row, and they read, Hogan sucks, and Hogan is a wimp. <laughs> First of all, for those of you who are not born in the 90s, wimp was a really mean word. So mm. I got called a wimp one time. It sucked. Oh, listen, I apologize 12 times. <laughs> At one point, Hulk Hogan's punching Big Bubba in the face, and Randy Harrison just straight up pulls Hulk by the hair. I'm like, what is happening right now? It is a very basic Hogan boss man match. Jimmy Hart yeah. gets involved. Boss man hits the boss man slam. Gets a two count. Hulk Hogan hulks up. Big boot leg drop. Three count. Hogan keeps the belt. Crowd mm-hmm. liked it. So, I mean, they were loud. Yeah. Most of them were cheering Hulk, but there was a pocket of people who were starting to boo Hulk at this point. Yep. Um, after the I match, think really, they just wanted the pasta. To be honest, <laughs> listen, the, we saw a meatball cost the same price to, uh, as a, as like chicken added to the bowl. Like, how big That's was right, that yeah. meatball going to be? It was as big as my head. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty big, let me tell you. Yeah, that's a, a brother size meatball. Brother. Dungeon of Doom hits the ring after the match. It's Kamala, Shark, Ming, Zodiac, and Taskmaster. No giant. Uh, Luger comes out, hits the ring. He's, they start beating up uh, all the members of the Dungeon of Doom, and they do the very typical backup for each other. Whoa, I'm going to punch you. Sting and Savage come out, separate them, and Lugan, Hogan looks at Luger and goes, Come back or go back where you came from, brother. And I'm like, oh dang, like he just got here. Uh, they cut to a, <laughs> they cut to a commercial. He doesn't up. even go here. <laughs> they cut to a commercial for Fall Brawl. They still hype up Hogan, Sting, Savage, and Vader. Um, Vader has not gone a wall officially on TV yet, but Vader's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll get more on that next week. But the, right as of now, Vader, Sting, Savage, and Hogan are still the babyface team for War Games. Mean Gene's back in the ring. Hogan asks Luger what he's doing here, and Luger says he's here for one reason. He says Hogan's the only World's Heavyweight Champion, and Luger wants the belt. He says he's been mm-hmm. down the same roads as Hulk. He's beaten the same guys Hulk's been. He's beaten. And he's sick and tired of playing with kids. He wants to play with the big boys. That's an iconic line, man. Let me tell you. Hulk says he'll be champion forever in a day. And he'll, he challenges Luger to a match next week on Nitro for the belt. They shove each other. Sting and, and Savage separate each other. They go back to the commentary desk to hype up next week's show. Where did Mongo get the dog from? And, and then we go off the air. A um, couple things I, I noted at the end of the show. Luger, who's not a very like strong promo... Mm-hmm. Cut cut the better part of that promo over Hulk. Yeah, um, true. I, be- very, I, be- very I believed so, yeah. him way more than Hulk. Mm-hmm. Um, I also thought it was weird that the commentators like just looked at the monitors and didn't turn to the camera like at the end of the show, like looking sideways. Mm-hmm. I'm like, just turn. Yeah, you're right about Luger. I think when he came out, he was talking about now, like you really believed it. You believed what he said. He's like, I'm gonna work for the championship. I don't want it handed to me. I want to work for it. And I'm going to, you know, if it takes me a month or a year or five years, I'm going to get a championship match. And then what surprised me was Hulk Hogan's like, you know what? You don't got to wait five years. I'll give you a title shot right now. Shake my hand. And I'm like, listen, Hulk, if I were you, you know, maybe put this off a little bit because he's on fire right now. Yeah. But he's um, like, no, he's the fighting champion, right? Yeah. Brother. brother. I mean, and, and, and that's interesting. Just like the amount of stuff they built and like hyped up going into next week's Nitro. Like, so... We'll, we'll get into next week here in a minute, but like we know a lot more coming out of Nitro than we did coming out of SummerSlam for like mm-hmm. Raw versus Nitro. So like I know more of what I'm going to see on Nitro. At least I have an idea of like if I tune in, I'm going to see a world title match. Mm-hmm. So every week, way what we're going to do, and this will be a little bit harder when the shows go head to head, we're going to do match moment and show of the week. Yes, uh, sir. Do you want to start with your match of the week? My match of the week, uh, we talked about how much it meant to me to see this match. is Eddie Guerrero versus Dean Malenko, two out of three falls. Um, just as I said, it's a technical masterpiece. And seeing a match from Eddie that I'd never seen before, 
uh, was absolutely amazing. It really meant a lot to me. Match of the week, baby. That, that was that was in my consideration. I'm going to go Hakushi one two three kid at SummerSlam. Um, it it didn't fit in '95. It fit here, mm-hmm. which is weird. Yep. Um, I'm going to go moment of the week, and I think the obvious one is Lex Luger showing up on Nitro. Um, mm-hmm. That is the, that is the first shot fired in the war yep. uh, between the two. It, it's the biggest moment of the five shows we covered, I think. 100%. I would like to pick something different, but I just can't really. I mean, even to this day, you see video packages of the Monday Night War or whatever on WWE, and they'll show shots of this, of Lex Luger walking through the aisle. It's an iconic shot, and I could pick nothing else for a moment of the week besides this. All right, how about your show of the week? There's five to choose from, which is tough. Uh, I think for what it I, – I, I don't know what you're going to say for this. Uh, for just for what it meant for wrestling history, I'm going to go with Nitro because it was entertaining. Luger and uh, Pillman, great match. Sting and Flair, uh, just the enormity of what it represented – uh, show of the week. Although I really did like that SummerSlam. I really was entertained by that. So I also went Nitro. Um, this is the, it's the only show of the five that we watched that I actually have rewatched before, like mm-hmm. on yeah, purpose, like actually sought mm-hmm. it out to see it. Um, mm-hmm. I love the Liger Pillman match. Um, I will always watch Ric Flair versus Sting. The Luger thing is cool. And, and honestly, like Hogan's just so insane at this point. Like, <laughs> he he is a he is illiterate and babbling, but he like, mm-hmm. he, he draws you in. Mm-hmm. So next week we're gonna get into an actual format here. Um, we're not going to be like preparing for war anymore. The war starts next week on the Monday Night Warfare podcast. We've got three different shows to watch from a two day span. Uh, we've got WCW Monday Nitro from September the 11th, 1995. That's a it's the final Nitro before Fall Brawl 1995. You're going to see Hulk Hogan defend the WCW title against Lex Luger. The Macho Man Randy Savage against Scott Norton. Also Sabu's debut. That's a lot of show for an hour. Uh, WWF Monday Night Raw, September the 11th, 1995. It's the new fall season premiere. It's the first Raw since SummerSlam. Also the first Raw since Nitro. Shawn Michaels versus Sid for the Intercontinental titles announced. So a title mm-hmm. match on both shows. Um, and there, there is a lot of backing between Sid and Sean going back to WrestleMania 11. So there is a story built into that one. Mm-hmm. But like, I, as a kid, I think I would have been more inclined to watch the familiar and watch Raw. But yeah, looking at it, looking at it now, I think I'm more excited for Nitro of the two. Oh, I absolutely am. We're also going to we're also going to watch a little bit of ECW Hardcore TV. Uh, it's mm-hmm. September the twelfth, nineteen ninety five. This is the first ECW since uh, Nitro started, and you want to talk about a tag team matchup? It's Chris Benoit and Two Cold Scorpio against the Steiner Brothers. Man, what a match, dude! So a lot of good action all around. We thank you for watching us, whether you're on YouTube in video form or in audio form. Hop on in, subscribe, follow, do whatever you got to do. The war is just about to begin, Wade. The shot has been fired. The shot heard around the world. It's Fort Sumter, baby. We're in it now. We thank you for watching us on the Monday Night Warfare. We'll see you next week.